This podcast is a quest for well-being, a quest for a meaningful life through the exploration of fundamental truths, enlightening ideas, insights on physical, mental, and spiritual health. The inspiration is love. The aspiration is to awaken new ways of thinking that can lead us to a new way of being, being well. Welcome to Body, Mind, and Soul Healing Conversations. Life is more than just going through the motions. There is more to life than just surviving. It's time for you to thrive. Valeria interviews Linda Feliciano. She is an intuitive healer and awareness coach. She helps people stop living the life they think they should live and start creating the life they want to live. Her multidimensional framework takes a practical approach to healing and development by helping you break through your blocks and unhealthy patterns. She combines her gifts for clarity, no-nonsense, intuition, and compassion to help you identify and heal the wounds that drive your self-sabotaging behaviors and help you reconnect with your unique gifts and your deepest needs and desires. Linda is a certified practitioner of Teal Swan's The Completion Process, a certified Arch Healing Practitioner, C-A-H-P, and a certified Soul Realignment Practitioner. She is a co-author of the Amazon bestseller book, Woke, Ahas, Awakenings, and Illuminations on the Path to Conscious Living and Enlightenment, and has been featured in publications like The Elephant Journal, Boston Voyager, Poets Unlimited, The Dare to Feel podcast, The Trauma Transformed podcast, and The Mental Health and Wellness Show podcast, among others. Meet Linda at thelunahealing.com. Here's the interview with Linda Feliciano. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here with you and your listeners. What do you think is the opposite of life? This is so serendipitous because just a couple days ago, I got a Facebook reminder for a post I had made a couple of years ago related to this very subject. It was a post that was based on a comment made by the character Dawson Leary from Dawson's Creek on the series finale episode. And I know I'm dating myself a little bit here, but still. After Jen dies, oh, by the way, spoiler alert, right? <laughs> but after Jen dies, Dawson is talking to Joey and he says something to the effect that People use the expression life and death, implying that life is the opposite of death. He then says, and now I'm quoting, but birth is the opposite of death. Life has no opposite. And when I heard that years ago, it really made me think because we live in a universe of polarity and so far is the only concept that I found that doesn't seem to have an opposite, or at least as far as language is concerned, as far as I can tell. So clearly the idea deeply resonated with me because I actually did end up giving it a lot of thought. Now, I will give credit to Dawson, or well, technically, I guess the writers of the show, I suppose, and agree that life has no opposite. However, if I were to dive a little bit deeper on what feels like the opposite for me, I would have to say that it's probably stagnation or maybe inertia or resistance. Because life or Maybe more accurately, life force to me is flow, right? It's movement, sort of like kundalini kundalini energy of that serpent uncoiling, right? Of that energy moving. So for me, the opposite of that feels more like preventing that energy from flowing 
or keeping ourselves from experiencing this life with all that it entails. Love, hate, beauty, ugliness, joy, pain, and everything else in between. And I mean, isn't that what we are here for? What is the purpose of the human experience? Well, I think I already hinted at this in my other answer, but if I get more specific, I would say that the answer to me is in the question itself. I believe that the overarching purpose for all of us is just that, to experience life and experience being human. Now, how that manifests in each of our lives is different, and so is how we experience and how we navigate it. And because of our unique scenarios, that overarching or that big picture purpose branches out into subcategories, if you will. And each subpurpose is a pathway to the bigger purpose. So I think if I think a little bit more about it, the best analogy I can come up with is that the overarching purpose of experiencing life is like the ocean, right? With many, many rivers that flow into it. And each of those rivers is a pathway or an approach that we take towards that purpose. So, for example, the big purpose is to experience life and being human. So one pathway may be to experience deep unconditional love. Another may be to experience financial abundance. Another be, may be to experience unconditional support, etc. So how we approach that is different at different times, in different circumstances, and for each person. And even as we grow and change, so does our path to purpose as well. I mean, ultimately, I strongly believe that we choose to be here at this time in this place so we could immerse ourselves in the 360 experience of being human so that our souls can integrate that experience, that learning, and continue to evolve. And as each of our souls evolves, so does the universe. Sort of like the Neil Armstrong quote of one small step for man and one giant leap for mankind, right? So the one thing that I do want to add here is that in my opinion, people put the idea of purpose on a pedestal. Our culture, I think, and I'm including myself in this, by the way, is so obsessed with doing that I think that has extended to this obsession with finding your quote-unquote purpose, right? So if I could be so bold as to give your listener some unsolicited advice, it would be to stop trying to find your purpose and instead to start focusing on figuring out what brings you joy and what makes you feel excited about life. And then pursuing those endeavors. Because that is what can truly motivate you to feel, to fully experience this very, very strange roller coaster that we call life. And I will also like to point out that sometimes in order for us to find what brings us joy, we have to experience what brings us pain. Like I said before, we do live in a universe of polarity and therefore we often learn through the experience of contrast. Now, we know that something is easy because we've experienced something hard and the opposite is also true. We know bad because of the experience of good. We know pain because of the experience of pleasure, etc. And that is the whole point of experiencing and I mean experiencing with capital letters. At this time... What is the purpose of your life? Hmm. I think for me right now is to experience joy, to experience ease and fulfillment. 
So if I continue being the river and ocean analogy to death, I would say that those are my current rivers, if you will, meaning my current paths to purpose. It has, however, evolved. At some point in the past, I think it was to create safety and security for myself. At another time, it was to heal. At another time, it was to find my tribe. And as I said before, there is an overarching purpose, but our path to it changes as we move through life. But right now, joy, ease, and fulfillment are my purpose. And that can look like a lot of different things. For example, I want to have a deeply connected romantic relationship, right? It's the deeply com- deeply connected romantic relationship that I desire, which is something I believe will bring me a lot of joy. I want to teach others so they can heal, thrive, and find joy themselves. And that feels fulfilling to me. I want to feel like I have a lot of freedom and flexibility to pursue my desires and my interests, which will bring a sense of ease into my life, right? So all of those desires and pursuits are part of my current path to experiencing life more fully and more deeply. I do want to be clear here that I am just using those as examples, right? Yes, they happen to be real things that I desire and that I am pursuing at the moment, but I think it is really important for us, myself included, to stay open to the possibility that sometimes what we desire may come to us in a very unexpected way that may not be exactly what we envisioned. What are some of the greatest misconceptions about happiness, in your opinion? Oh, boy. (laughs) I would say one of the greatest misconceptions, if not the greatest, is that happiness is a permanent state. Happiness is an emotion, and emotions are temporary and fleeting. Its very etymology tells us that, right? So emotion as an energy in motion. So it's supposed to move through you. Now, one quick note about emotions here is that they really are an essential tool because they provide us with a lot of information. They are trying to tell us something because they're the physical expression of how our subconscious mind interpreted something it perceived. So when you perceive something, it goes through the filter of your past experiences, your core wounds, your beliefs, etc. And your mind assigns meaning to that based on those past experiences. So that's what creates the emotion, which is the physical manifestation of that process. Now, If you want to learn more about emotions, I do cover this and how I differentiate between emotions and feelings in a YouTube video that I have that is called Feelings Versus Emotions. But for now, suffice it to say that emotions are not intended to be long-term. Now, the bad news here is that this includes happiness. So happiness is not meant to be permanent. The good news is that it also includes pain. So pain is also not intended to be permanent. And I I know, I know, when we are in pain, it does not feel temporary at all. It's what I call treadmill minutes, right? It's like when you're at the gym and are on a treadmill for what feels like ages, and then you look at the time and it's only been a few seconds. So it's exactly like that. But the point is that happiness and pain are two extremes on the same spectrum. So they cannot be permanent. And the ironic thing is that because we live in this universe of polarity, these two extremes go together. So in order for us to expand our capacity for joy or happiness, our capacity for pain will also have to expand. Think of it like a pendulum, right? So 
the swing to the right is in direct correlation with the swing to the left. So the farther the little bob, you know, the little ball in the middle travels to the left, the farther it will travel to the right. But the bob only stays at those two points momentarily before swinging back to the other side. So emotions, including happiness, move from one side to the other and everything in between. So knowing that, what I would say is what we want to aim for is that sweet spot around the middle, right? Which can often be a place of peace, of contentment and balance where we are open to move through the full experience of emotions or I guess in other words, the full range of movement of the pendulum. What is healing to you? I think that in order for me to answer this question, I first have to talk a little bit about what trauma is. Gabor Mate, and if you're a listener and you don't know who he is, please look his documentary up. It's called The Wisdom of Trauma, and it's great. Now, Gabor Mate says that trauma is what happens inside you as a result of what happened to you. Now, I'm a lot wordier than that, but you have probably figured that out by now. But I want to emphasize the importance of that first part. Not exactly what happens to you, but what happens inside you, right? So knowing that, how I would define Fine trauma, or in my experience, trauma is a scary or painful experience that because it's not or cannot be fully processed or resolved in the moment that it happens, it drives us to disconnect from ourselves as a way to adapt and survive. For most of us on this journey, it then continues to impact us from our subconscious mind well into adulthood. Now, these types of wounds are usually created in childhood situations where often a need was not met and we were not able or sometimes we were not even allowed to fully express our emotions about it in that moment. So with that in mind, to me, healing is having a corrective experience where you identify and express that unmet need in the respective suppress or repressed emotions and feel validated and supported while doing so. So identify and express the unmet need, express the emotion surrounding it, and get validation and support. So for example, one approach that I use in my healing practice is shadow work, which shadow work basically is helping bring the subconscious into conscious awareness. So helping bring the subconscious wounds and beliefs into our conscious mind. And it can be really helpful as a tool to help connect our current, uh, let's say, less than healthy patterns to their root cause. Think of a woman who, actually, I will use myself as an example here. I had a pattern, and if I'm going to be completely honest, it still rears its ugly head here and there, but I had a pattern of picking relationships, friendships mostly, but relationships where other people needed me and constantly depended on me for emotional support. And most of the time, these relationships were not reciprocal because I didn't feel I was afforded the same level of support as I was giving. So, While I resented them, I continued to engage in the dynamic until eventually I either got fed up and blew up or stopped providing support 
And what do you think happened when I did that? Yep, most of those friendships ended. So what you need to know about me is that I was abandoned as a baby. And when someone suffers abandonment in childhood, the break of that natural bond, it's scary to the mind of a child and a threat to their survival. So instead of believing that our biological family or our caretakers are flawed and could not or did not want to take care of us, we develop a belief system, right, that shifts that responsibility onto us, the child. This is the subconscious mind hard at work here. So we create this beliefs that we are not enough, that we are not worthy, that we are not lovable. And all of these beliefs are meant to protect us because if it is about us, then we can fix it and not be abandoned again, right? So it makes sense. If we're the ones that are at fault, then we can fix it and we can change it, right? In my case, this translated to a belief that if others needed me, right, then how could they abandon me? Because they needed me. They needed my support. They needed my emotional support. And the thing is that these beliefs seep into our subconscious from, from where they will continue to motivate our behavior well into adulthood, and they often can wreak havoc in our lives. So hopefully you can see how getting to the root cause of the wound can help you start unraveling all of the different ways and areas of our lives that are impacted by trauma. Now, of course, this sounds a lot easier than it actually is, right? Because I'm just making the connection here. I'm just serving it to you, right? But this took me years of work to unravel. So getting to a place of awareness of our patterns and our trauma will inform how we go about healing it. And to me, it's really the first step in the healing journey, And that's what shadow work is all about. Now, when you put shadow work together with other modalities that can help people reconnect to who they are at a soul level, you can create some massive shifts. Healing helps you integrate the emotional experience that was repressed or suppressed so you can release some of that pain and get clear and honest about what your needs and what your desires are. And when you do that, you can move through life in a more conscious and fulfilling way. Question number nine, what is the meaning of freedom to you? What is to be free? Freedom. To me, freedom is the ability to consciously express myself authentically. Consciously being the key word here. It's not about doing or saying whatever I want. Doing or saying whatever you want from a place of reactivity or avoidance or resistance or based on someone else's expectations doesn't feel like freedom to me. It actually feels quite the opposite. Because it's often done to comply or reject or protect, etc. So it feels tied or shackled really to something like a fear or a trauma or someone else's actions. And in some way it feels burdensome to me. And I think it's because it is not conscious and these subconscious motivations can keep us from our true desires or what really moves us right deep down inside. Now, We do need to recognize that these subconscious motivations are very real and valid. And they are in place often for very good reason. I mean, they are strategies that we created as a way to make sense of our circumstances and survive. 
and they did their job, right? We are here, we survived, most of us are somewhat sane. So they did their job, but they are no longer serving us and are now a lot of times getting in the way of what we want to do, what we want to create, who we want to be, how we want to feel, etc. The good news is that the more aware we become of our patterns and strategies, the closer we get to who we are, you know, at our core, and the easier it becomes to navigate life in a less reactive and a more conscious way. So freedom to me is more about tapping into what I truly feel and desire and expressing it authentically and in alignment. How I choose to express it can take many forms. It could be words, actions, art, energy, whatever. But the process requires that I am present with my needs and motivations, which honestly is hard enough to do even for someone who does this for a living. And as you do that, or as I do that, considering all of the external factors like other people's expectations, other people's feelings, possible consequences, conflicting desires, and so on and so on, right? And then making choices that take all of those factors into account, but are not driven by them, which is an important distinction. And ultimately accepting the consequences of those choices. What is to be spiritual and what is spirituality? That is a really interesting question. And this one that I've pondered many times, but I don't know if I have a static answer because I think my answer, well, I know my answer has changed and evolve throughout the years, and it probably will again. Though, to be fair, I think that's probably true for all the answers that I'm giving during this podcast. But if I think about it, I would probably separate that into two questions. First, what is it to be spiritual? And I say that, to me, being human is spiritual. So anything and everything in our world is by definition spiritual because it's intrinsically linked to the human experience. And that means everything, including animals, inanimate objects, etc. Everything interacts with everything else and everything is connected. And to me, that is spiritual. Now, as to the second part What is spirituality? I would say that spirituality to me is seeking. It's that drive to know, to learn, to find, that motivation, that inspiration, that desire that we all have deep inside, that esoteric force that moves us, be it conscious or unconscious. We have a tendency to separate spirituality from the more carnal pursuits or things our society deems negative, like sex or anger, jealousy, or being concerned with your physical appearance. But to me, it is all part of our experience. We are seeking, whether we know it or not, I mean, we are seeking approval or we are seeking pleasure or we are seeking validation or we are seeking self-awareness or we are seeking peace or we are seeking enlightenment or all of the above. Whatever it is, it's driving our thoughts, our emotions, our actions And it is an individual pursuit as much as a collective one. And it really is all in the service of knowing ourselves more in a deeper way, in a better way. That, to me, is spirituality. 
how do you define success? What is to be successful to you? I love this question. My idea of success is not exactly conventional and not at all based on what our society defines as success. To me, being successful is about a sort of mastery of the self, if there's even such a thing. But it's getting to a place of satisfaction with who I am as a person, not so much where I am in life. The where to me is temporary. Yes, it feels great, you know, when things are going well in your career or your social life. And I don't want to minimize that. But what I've learned is that life has many ups and downs. And the ups are just as temporary as the downs. So if you're satisfied with who you are as a person, it makes it easier to weather the downs And if you're not satisfied with who you are as a person, even the ups don't feel as fulfilling. And you can see this a lot with people who suffer from imposter syndrome, for example. They may have achieved something of value, but they don't value themselves enough to feel that they deserve it. And then so they cannot truly enjoy it. Now, I do want to be clear here that satisfaction with who you are doesn't mean that you are done growing or healing for that matter. What it means is that you know there may, there may be more for you to discover, to experience, to learn, to evolve, but you are content with you're content with and proud of how far you've come. And you have reached a deeper sense of who you are and your capacity for expansion. So navigating the ebbs and flows of life become, becomes less overwhelming. So why did you choose to do what you do? It evolved organically. I mean... I think it was always there laying dormant for whenever I was ready, but it definitely was a slow burn. I started my healing journey back in 2012 or just around that time because I wanted to heal my own trauma. And I tried a bunch of different healers and teachers and modalities. And as I was healing and evolving... I realized that I was also growing tired of my then job that I had as a systems engineer, which I did for over 20 years. But I knew then that I would eventually venture into into entrepreneurship. And back then, one of my mentors kept telling me that I would be a great healer and wanted me to work with her as one of her teachers. And I was dead set against it. I mean, I did not want the responsibility and and a great part of that is because at the time I couldn't separate the experience of helping others from taking on their problems as my responsibility to fix, which, by the way, is a very, very common, is something very, very common for those of us who do this work. I mean, but we could probably do a whole other podcast on that topic alone. <laughs> but eventually... I went to a workshop that, unbeknownst to me, was a shadow work training retreat. Now, I thought I was going to learn about how to use shadow work for my own healing, but it turns out that it was for that, but also to train people on how to facilitate for others. And by the end of the week, I knew this was it for me. And I started making arrangements to transition into this work. What's interesting and the funny thing really is that it wasn't until then that I remember that as a child, I used to play teacher all the time. And I also taught other kids in my elementary school. And throughout my entire life, teaching and helping others with their pain has always been something I just did, right? But because it was so natural to me, I never thought of it as anything special or noteworthy. And I've come to realize that 
things we loved or did instinctively as children are oftentimes our gifts and our path to fulfillment. And so far, I've seen that this is true for almost everyone. So helping people get in touch with their soul gifts has become an essential part of the work that I do. But I digress. The point is that I love helping people put all the pieces of the puzzle together. And like I said before, I tried a lot of different things on my own journey and found that there is a need for a more mm, practical approach to spirituality and self-development, in my humble opinion. There's a lot of woo-woo stuff out there that, while inspirational, it doesn't get into the dirty work of healing, And don't get me wrong. I mean, I love inspirational, right? There is a lot of value in it, but I feel that there needs to be a balance. One example that comes to mind, and I actually talk about this in my manifesting tips YouTube video, is that people love to talk about the law of attraction and manifesting from an energetic level, right? But what most people don't talk about is that you actually have to take action towards what you want to create. So the more practical 3D approach to the work is sometimes lost in the shuffle. And as I'm talking about it, I'm remembering this parable. Now, I'm not a religious person at all. But I'm remembering this parable of the drowning man who kept praying to God to save him, right? And basically, it's this man that is drowning, and there's a flood, and this man is drowning, and he's praying for God to save him. And a boat comes in, and the people in the boat yell out to him and say, hey, we can help you. And he's like, no, 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 I'm fine. God will save me. And then a bigger boat comes by and says, hey, jump in. We can help you. He's like, no, no, God will save me. Then a helicopter comes out and they call out to him and they say, we can help you. And he's like, no, no, God will save me. So guess what happened? He drowned, right? So (laughs) when he died, he goes to heaven and is all disgruntled and complete. Well, I don't know if he was disgruntled, but I'm taking some poetic license here, right? But (laughs) he's complaining to God and says, God, you know, I'm a man of faith and I was praying to you to save me and you didn't help me. And God looks at him and says, I sent you two bows and a helicopter. What the hell are you doing here? So I say that and I share that story because my point here is that I see my job as helping people into the boat. Talk to me for a moment about the services you offer. Thank you so much for asking. Basically, I condense years of my hard work on my own healing into what I think is a simple yet profound transformational process to guide and support others through their own journey. I created a multidimensional framework that um, takes a more practical approach to healing and development to help people break through their blocks and unhealthy patterns. So the focus really is on helping my clients heal by developing awareness, by learning and applying new skills and tools uh, and spiritual teachings into real life situations. And also helping them tap into their unique gifts so that they can basically put it all together and through that process gain some clarity about the life they want to create and then helping them start to take aligned action towards it. Now, I have several programs and they are very targeted and are usually six months or less. Of course, you know, people can continue to work um, with me after the program is over. But the idea behind each of my programs is that I will arm the people, my clients, with what they need so that they are not dependent on me for years to come. Because personally, I believe that is a disservice to the clients, right? So the my main program is a three-month fast-track program that includes 
um, training on spiritual concepts, healing and personal development skills, including emotional intelligence. And it also includes uh, Akashic record readings and several coaching sessions, among, among other things. And this is targeted more towards people who are relatively new to this work. I also have a program called Individual Mastery that is similar, but actually focuses more on coaching sessions for those who are not new to this work. Now, whether they've worked with me or other healers in the past. I also have a leadership coaching program that focuses on helping people connect to the leader within uh, and is more of a personal approach for anyone who wants to develop their skills to influence and impact, empower and support others. And I also offer group coaching once or twice a year, which is really a more cost effective way of working with me for the people who want to continue to grow and have the support of coaching and community, but don't need as much individual teaching or guidance because they've been at it for a while. Now, if you want to find, if any of your listeners want to find more about my offerings, you can visit my website at thelunahealing.com. Where can we find more information about you, your work, products, services, and future projects? To find more about working with me or about me and my experience, your listeners can visit my website at thelunahealing.com. And there they will also find resources like my articles, books, blogs, guest appearances, and also a link to my YouTube videos about healing, spirituality, personal development, emotional intelligence, and even some of the topics that we touched on here. Also, I'd like to offer as a special gift and thank you to your audience that they can download my free ebook or webcast or both, whatever they choose, on how to start healing your inner critic. If you're interested, um, you just go to thelunahealing.com forward slash the quest, and you can sign up and download it from there. What are three things about life you know for sure as of this moment? That most people have childhood trauma and don't know it. I see this over and over with clients, with friends, with colleagues, online, especially online. And I actually have a blog post about activism where I talk about how this affects not just ourselves and those around us and those close to us, but also the world as a whole. Because without looking at our shadow, meaning our subconscious wounds, we end up bringing all of our own trauma, wounds, and biases to our interactions with others. They end up doing the same, so we end up in a cycle of perpetually triggering one another. And having been through a collective, very traumatic experience in the last couple of years, I think this is why it seems that everything is escalating and feels so polarized right now. The second thing that I know for sure about life is ah, that growth is not a linear upward and forward trajectory. I also talk about this in a YouTube video, on a YouTube video. I don't, I don't know how you say that. On a YouTube video, I think is the correct way of saying it. But as we grow, sometimes we need to take a step back to get a deeper learning and then leap forward or maybe even take a step sideways to reinforce the learning or sometimes stop altogether so we can integrate and apply what we learn and rest and prepare for the next wave. And the third and last thing that I know for sure is that we are not broken. I believe we are just the unassembled puzzle pieces of some maybe nondescript but beautiful scenery. And 
it's not until we start putting all of the pieces of the puzzle together that we can get a sense of what the picture is going to look like. Thank you so much for your presence, for sharing your wisdom and doing what you do. Thank you so much for having me. This was fun. Namaste. Thank you for listening. To learn more about Linda Feliciano and her work, please visit thelunahealing.com. To learn more about this podcast, please visit fitforjoy.org slash podcast. Thank you again for listening and bye for now.